Okay, so I'm packing, I'm excited, I'm getting ready uh, to make sure I have everything I need because we're going exploring. Um, where you say? Well, wetlands. I'm gonna make sure you have everything you need when you go into wetlands or anytime. Okay, so let's see, I've got my extra shirt, very important in case I get wet. Got my socks, uh, got the shoes already in the car. One should take an extra, you know, shorts or long pants or something, always the hat. Um, I'm gonna have to stuff this in, but you should take a towel. I should have looked for a smaller one, but that's okay. I need that. Stick it in. All right, and the water bottle. Yeah, here's the water bottle. And your plastic bag, because if you get wet and your clothes are wet, you know, the people that drive us are not happy when you stick wet things in their car. Okay, so pick up your backpack and follow me. We're looking at the primary dunes. But just since last year, this dune has exceeded the height of the steps because of the tremendous power of the winds during the hurricane depositing the sand. The wind blows the sand and it's deposited it on the leeward side and the range of these dunes now is creeping backward. From the primary dune, you move down into the swale, which shows some little scrub plants, and then you move up into the inter-dune meadow, and that leads to a shrub zone. This area right in front of me is now maritime forest, but if you look, you can see that it's growing on the back side of, or the leeward side, we would call it, of the dune system and you will be able to see where the primary dunes begin, right on the beach. And then they dip into the swales, and secondary dunes form, and another swale, and so forth. And the whole process moves to the inland, and the further away from the ocean, the more vegetation you can get. And now we have this absolutely beautiful back of the dune, with all the undergrowth as well as the primary tree, which is the live oak. Right now we are on top of a dune ridge. This is not a primary dune, it's not even a secondary dune. We call these the back dunes. It's more like a tertiary dune ridge. And we're going to descend into what's known as a swale, which in layman's language would be the big dip between two sets of dunes. So we're on top of one this side, and we can pan over and you can see the other side where there is another complete dune ridge and there's a very cool looking path which is a great place to hike. Not every swale has a rope swing but this one does. I'm always looking for something when we're out hiking. Right now I am looking for some water between dune ridges. Fresh water, not salt water. And that would be called a, oh, how do we say that word again? Um, it's a S-L-O-U-G-H. Yes, that's it. An S-L-O-U-G-H forms where the surface of the ground is close to the water table. Some of them are temporary and will evaporate, but some look like ponds, big ponds, and they're permanent. It can even lead to swamps. Ah, I found what I'm looking for. Here is a beautiful example of an S-L-O-U-G-H. This is not a temporary one. This one is going to stay year round. Be careful because it contains critters that could be harmful to humans. I see one. There it is, an alligator. Where are we? Well, we're in a slough, or a slough. But for less confusion, we'll just say S-L-O-U-G-H. Okay. What a find. This S-L-O-U-G-H is right in the middle of the dense maritime forest. The Spanish moss is everywhere in this forest, but that's not what I want to talk about right now. Would you believe your eyes? Look at these amazing cypress knees all over. Definitely a sign that we are in a wetland. These cypress knees 
are woody bark covered outgrowths from the trees and they are supposed to help support the trees that are in this waterlogged soil. I love the bird life around the areas of the SLOUGHs. Oh, that one's a good green one. There's birds in the trees. I know there are. Get out my binoculars. There, an anhinga. Oh, and then of course we have people who love to climb the trees. Spanish moss is not Spanish and it's not moss. It's an epiphyte, part of the bromeliad family. It's amazing stuff. It gets its nutrients directly from the air. But it, when it rains, you can see that it turns slightly green. Do you know what that is? The outer sheath on each little fiber is so translucent when it's wet, you can see through to the chlorophyll. Incredible. It spreads like crazy because after the flowers have formed seeds, and we'll show you a flower, they blow around and wherever they land, they just detach and grow. Look at that. Resurrection ferns are another one of my favorite epiphytes. They look pretty dead when they haven't had water, but give them some rain or give them some water out of the garden hose and they turn green and lush, just like the water of Christ, who is living water, will do to our lives. If you pick up some of the dead resurrection fern and put it just in a glass of water, within an hour or less, you will see it turning green. I had to show this to my son who really didn't believe that would happen. Usually lichens can be found growing alongside of the other two epiphytes because they're also epiphytes. They are pretty special. They represent two different kingdoms in the animal kingdoms. They represent fungus and algae. And I'm going to show you a page I wrote that you need to read. I'll upload it for you because it will tell you how this fingerprint of God in a lichen is beyond anybody's imagination unless they study the lichens. The top and the bottom of the lichen is actually the fungus, it's called the cortex, but sandwiched between it you have the algae, which is green and does all the work of photosynthesizing to give the epiphyte food. Amazing. Rather like the Lord, we're covered by Him and we're anchored on a rock or a hard surface by Jesus. Well, I'm getting out my binoculars because it's time for me to look at the birds. The wetland is the best place to see them. Herons galore. Blue herons, great blue herons. There are beautiful great white herons. Oh, I love watching the blue herons take off. That's so awesome. Don't get too low, birdie. There's alligators in there. Good, he's resting. And you know what? I just also love it when I see the little guys swimming around. And this guy's looking for his dinner, but he better be careful because I saw an alligator off to the side. They're so brave. Watch them strike. Did you know they can bend their necks like that? Because they have got an, a very long neck bone halfway down. So that's how they can make an S neck. And that little moorhen is in definite danger of being eaten by an alligator that's swimming around in that wetland freshwater pond. Now who has ever seen anything like this? This is a huge flock of ibis. The white ones are mature and the brown ones are the immature, just the, the recently hatched kind of teenagers, like you guys. Oh, if you're careful, you can find a rookery in a wetland. Well, we found this one. I'm telling you, you don't need to be watching movies and silly things when you watch birds because you can see all kinds of behaviors. Some of them are kind and nice and some of them are far from it. Look at that. Would you get out of my spot? That is my branch. You leave. I mean, there's so many others, but they're not even stopping to see if there's another branch. Now, just, just look at the sibling rivalry. You know, one guy lands and another guy says, but I don't want you there. So I'm just going to make sure you get out of my way. Yeah, yeah, we'll fight. Go, leave. I mean, who needs to watch movies? Look at this stuff. It's real life, bird life. And then there's my great blue, just minding his own manner, saying, oh, these immature ibis. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sibling rivalry, like nothing you've ever seen before, fighting, fighting. I hope you all are not doing that while you're at home with this virus deal. 
And then there is the sophisticated, beautiful, snowy egret, dressed in full breeding plumage, recognizable by the black beak and the yellow feet. And then we have my anhinga, also called the snake bird because look at that neck and when it's swimming it sometimes resembles a snake. That's a female because of the, the coloration. Hanging out its wings because they don't have any oil so when they get in the water they have to come up and let them dry off and they sit on a branch and usually spread their wings on a washing line. Hello Cardinal, yes we saw you coming in, you thought we had food. It's time to turn our attention to something else. I think that you're going to enjoy this next little exploration. Welcome to Okefenokee Freshwater Swamp, the largest freshwater swamp in the United States of America and one of the largest in the world. The home of Neverwits, the pickerel weed, Pitcher plants, amazing. Alligators, oh yes, you will see some alligators. We've already seen some alligators. And what about spiders? Creepy, I know, but spiders are just amazing. And just any minute, I am going to show you a cypress tree that is common only to Okefenokee. It buttresses. And you're going, what is a buttress? you soon gonna find out. This isn't what I expected at all. I know, it's totally different from what I imagined. Well, this is just the man-made canal, and it leads into the swamp prairies. Why is the water so black? Is it dirty or something? Well, actually, it's a, brown, a black water swamp. It's, uh, it's formed by the tannic acid. Yeah, it's actually one of the largest black water swamps in the world. It's the largest in North America, at over 700 square miles. That's 438,000 acres and they compare to a brown water swamp by the fact that these are generally basin swamps and brown water swamps are also called alluvial swamps which means they're at the mouths of rivers so they carry lots of sediment in them and therefore they're brown. Good job. Cool. cool. Very cool. All right I want you to be looking very carefully there's going to be lots of things to see. Paul, what do you remember? Um, I remember the bubblegum lichen and the Spanish moss. Excellent. What do you remember? Oh, I remember definitely seeing all the hooded pitcher plants and the sundews and the bladderworts. The carnivorous plants the are awesome. The carnivorous plants. So cool. Mm -hmm. Do you have something you remember seeing? The cypress knees were incredible. There are lots of those. We'll see a whole slew of different things down here. What about alligators? Oh, look, there's one over there right now. Look. Oh, 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 so cool. cool. Do you guys see all the big trees? This is the pond cypress. They're the oldest and largest trees in the swamp. Wow. wow. I've heard that they can live for over a thousand years. Whoa, okay. that's a long time. What's all that stuff hanging from the pond cypress? It looks like a woolly mammoth. <laughs> I think it's Spanish moss. Spanish moss is an epiphyte, which means it's an air plant. It gets its nutrients from the air, and it doesn't harm the trees. Isn't it related to pineapples somehow? Mm-hmm. It's in the pineapple family. Because yeah. it's a bromeliad, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a bromeliad. That's correct. Okefenokee Swamp is the headwaters for two major rivers. The St. Mary's, which goes across land and enters the Atlantic just at the north of Amelia mm -hmm. Island. We've seen that. And then we've got the Swami River, which goes towards the south and enters the Gulf of Mexico somewhat above Clearwater. Remember I said we'd see lots of lichens in this trip? Well, this swamp area has all the same lichens that you saw in the freshwater S-L-O-U-G-H area. Look at these cypress knees. Amazing, amazing. It's not confirmed that they help to aerate, but they do store a lot of starch. So they must somehow be uh, doing things that everybody has not yet discovered how the system works. I talked about buttressing. See how those cypress trees swell out at the bottom and have like fluted uh, rear ends, so to speak? That's called buttressing. 
And these are the only cypress trees that do this, the ones down here in this area. This is really one of the best examples of buttressing. It's quite incredible. It's, it's supposed to help the trees stabilize a little bit in this very watery uh, land that they live in. We wanted to check the age of a tree. We did have a collector's permit at this point and we're using a special device. You need to go, you need to go in there about 60. It's an increment bore and we were able to go in from the outside bark just to the inside without harming the tree in any way. And if we were very, very careful as we were doing this, uh, we were quite successful in being able to pull out a teeny tiny pencil sized core sample of oh my goodness. the rings on this tree. Now we didn't have microscopes to look at here, but look at the sample, it's amazing. Yeah, it's covering, oh, covering, perfect, covering. perfect, perfect. It's called dendrochronology when you examine a core like this and you're looking at the broad rings and you're looking at the narrow rings to try and estimate the age of these trees. They can live to thousands of years. Roughly speaking, we were figuring that we had gotten ours at least into the hundreds of years. Now the fun begins. We're heading into the prairie, the wet prairie. It's all watery. We're going to see all kinds of plants, but keep your eyes peeled. Alligators hide everywhere. We're looking at never wets, amazing plants, very special. See, cool. these are never wet leaves. You put them in the water and the water just drips off and they never get wet. That's really cool. Keep your eyes peeled. This is a part of the Okefenoki where you're going to see beautiful flowers, grasses, shrubs, more trees. But watch out for those spider webs. They are huge. They span big areas. They're amazing. The zigzag in the middle there is actually seen as ultraviolet light to little birds and other animals. That way they don't run into these big spider webs and get stuck growing right between the hooded pitcher plants. And here's another parrot behind this hooded. Looks like it's a bud and it hasn't opened yet. There, can you see that? And then these hooded pitcher plants have these little hoods on them and the insects can still get in. I don't wanna damage this, but they can get in underneath. They can get in, but they can't get out. You can see it. You can see it more clearly on this one. How they creep in. And creep out. They and they can. cannot get out, but they think that these little light spots back here are the exit, and so in fact they're enticed further down the plant mm. until they finally fall into some enzymes at the bottom. And these little white, little bell looking ones are called fatter bush. They're so cool looking. There's so many gorgeous plants out here. Okay, now we've got to move on here a little bit. Everybody's looking for alligators. Well, what if we go out and we look at the blow-ups? Blow-ups are the peat from the bottom of the Okefenokee Swamp, which is only about 18 inches to 24 inches in depth, by the way. And methane bubbles blow up these peat chunks and alligators love to hide underneath them. You often find them around the water lilies. Okefenokee means land of the trembling earth and that's because if you stand on them it moves. Of course if you want to stay on the boat and pull up a water lily just to see how long its stem is that's good too and they're hollow so to prove it we got this guy here blowing bubbles into uh, some liquid. Okay, swamp water. He didn't swamp. <laughs> cool. Okay. What is it? It's bladderwort. Oh, it's another carnivorous plant. In fact, it's the smallest carnivorous plant on the planet. Yes, it's really cool. It has these really small bladders, and when the plant is submerged, it creates a vacuum inside those bladders, and then if a microscopic organism gets close to the sensor hairs, it'll suck it in in like a split second. It's so cool. Okay. There's all these pretty flowers here, but what is this icky, gross, muddy stuff? It's peat. It's brought up by the 
um, gas bubbles from the bottom of the swamp. Oh, this is actually what's called a blow up. Whoa. Whoa. Cool. I wouldn't want to oh, wow. step on that. That'd be weird. <laughs> yeah, I get all wet. Whoa, what was that bubble that just came up? These are actually what's called peat blow ups. They're the peat at the bottom of the uh, swamp brought up by the methane gas bubbles from below. May I try? Oh, look at those bubbles coming up. Oh, it's like a bubble bath. <laughs> <laughs> Only not very clean. Mm, I want to go swimming. You really wouldn't want to swim in this water. There's a high chance there's an alligator right around here. Those beads could attract bugs. Whoa, look at the bubbles coming up. That's so cool. That's the methane gas that's actually pushing the peat up to create what we're standing on, a peat blow up. Watch the people up sink suddenly. I know. Anyway, I'm pretty light. Oh, oh, Matthew, Matthew. 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 No, Matthew. 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 Matthew, now go. you know why it's called Okefenokee, land of the trembling earth. All right. Wow, this is so incredible. This is amazing being on this peat battery. Um, we should probably collect some peat from the middle of it. Um, hey, Michael, would you please bring the container and peat gatherer, please? The peat blow-ups offer an excellent place for seeds to fall and germinate, and so the grasses accumulate, and as this area becomes a little more stable, uh, it is then actually called a battery, of course it's a human term, and gradually what's going to happen is you're going to have some trees growing up in these batteries and their roots are going to go down and anchor into the bottom of the swamp water, into the basin itself, offering much more stability. And as that begins to happen and more trees grow, we have what's called a house, and then we start to see lots of different uh, land animals creeping in. This water is tannic acid. It is very, very acidic. You can see that when we tested it, it was registering a four, sometimes it's a 3.5. But the plants that grow in this water enjoy an acidic environment. Okay, now we gotta get serious about finding these alligators. I think that if we maybe see where that bird is looking and follow the direction of its gaze, we're gonna come upon something pretty interesting like the big ones. Oh, and you know what? Baby alligators really like dragonflies, so bring that one along. Maybe we can feed a baby alligator. Uh-oh, do you see what I see? The bumps on the back of this alligator are scoots. Scoots are bony projections that actually absorb the heat from the sun and act just like a solar panel. Now, why do they need that? Because they are cold-blooded, or let's give them the real word, poikilothermic. And so they are totally dependent on an external environment for their temperature. Now this guy is opening his mouth, and it's a bit scary when you see that. He wasn't going to swallow any of us, but he got overheated. And so by doing that, it's the equivalent of a dog panting, and all the blood running through the, the tongue and the mouth area being exposed to the outside can cool down a little bit. This is an incredible skeleton of what was probably the largest dominant male alligator in the Okefenokee Swamp for almost 100 years. This is Oscar. He was over 13 feet and 1,000 pounds, I believe, if, if I'm correct. I've seen him myself and I've heard him and I've jumped in a car real fast when he pulled out of the water, let me tell you. Look at the work involved in piecing the skeleton back together. Quite something. Now, if you take a close look, they have an upper level of skeleton and that shows you the scoots. That's what appeared as lumpy bumps on that alligator we saw lying out in the sun and we actually did see that guy. 
Also, you can notice that the way they've got the limbs together, it's special joints, and that's what allows the alligator to lie down with its legs just all floppy looking, and then all of a sudden it can get right up there and be in running position. And let me tell you, you can't outrun an alligator, just so that you know, and you certainly can't outswim it. Now, this is a man that we met, and he's a little, well, let's uh, just say out of the ordinary. That is a live alligator that was over 11 foot, and he would ride it daily. But this is the little guy that is too cute for words, a baby. The coloration is so that they can appear to just be light flickering in the water, so birds passing by overhead might not notice that that's a tasty meal. Now, what should one do with an alligator? Well, one shouldn't turn it upside down because it will pass out, and that's for real, but you can hold it. And what you don't know is while you are holding it, and telling it not to bite you, cute little guy, it's making sounds when it opens its mouth that you can't hear, but every passing female in the swamp can hear. Now that guy's alive, he's for real, this isn't pretend. He would have liked to have had that dragonfly as a meal, by the way. Oh yes, one should wear the alligator, well, maybe not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a weird feeling, I can tell you, and once again, what everybody doesn't realize is the fact that these little guys, well, I think there were two of them, were making sounds we couldn't hear. Um, can't tell you that I actually want to wear them too often, but, you know, it was kind of cute. It was trying to kiss me, but I resisted. I'm married. See what came in? Three of these guys, well, they're girls, mamas, came swimming in quite rapidly. Fortunately, we were up out of the water, or we might not be talking to you right now but they will come when they hear the babies in distress. I think these guys are pretty big and I don't like how they're looking at me. You know, from the tip of the snout to the eye and in inches equals their length. I think it's time that we might be moving on. Besides, I'm getting really hungry and frankly, I don't think I want to become a meal for one of these guys. They're huge. Look at that. Lugging 800 pounds worth of flesh around. No wonder they just kind of flop down and go, oh, I'm just exhausted. This is too close for comfort. We're just kind of feet away. It's time to leave. Wow. Careful not to step on them. Guys, look how many pitcher plants there are. Yes, there's so many. And we got to see some yesterday, but there weren't nearly as many as there are here. Look and they didn't have flowers on them either. They only flower a certain time of year, and we're lucky and blessed enough to get a chance to see them now. Yeah, they're and it's so, so cool to see them close up. From the boat, you could barely see them. I think I'm going to try and get a closer look, guys. Oh, oh, oh. 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 I think this tannic acid is good for my skin. <laughs> I hope you brought an extra change of clothes with you. Oh yeah, I, I always remember the living science law. Always bring extra shirts and a towel. And a white trash bag. bag. Oh. I told you it would be amazing, incredible things to see. And now you know why you need to take a plastic bag. Just saying.